factorials and binomial coefficients. So the plan for both of these is to just write them down and then first do some simple bounds and then, well, first do some like really naive bounds and then do some simple bounds and then do some accurate bounds. So we shall start with factorials. So n factorial is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 okay, down to times 2 times 1. Okay, this comes up all the time and we would like to know the asymptotics for it. Uh, so as I said, you should always start with like the simplest possible thing. So I mean, our dream goal is to understand, you know, this is asymptotically equivalent to some function in standard form. We'll eventually get there with Sterling's formula, but let's start simple. So uh, the simplest upper bound is you can just say each of these terms is at most n. So this is at most n times n times n times n times n. And that one we can do. That's n to the n. Okay, so we have an upper bound. And that's actually not even going to be too terrible of an upper bound, even though it looks a little bit ridiculous. Uh, as for a lower bound, uh, can somebody suggest a lower bound of almost equal simplicity? I guess it's going to be a little bit more complicated, but... Uh, yeah, many people have their hands up and some people said it out loud, so you can do that. What's your name? Pranit. Pranit, what did you say? N over 2 to the power of N over 2. Yeah, that, thank you, because that's, that's exactly the one I have in mind. You could have been more sophisticated, but I was exactly hoping for this. You could just do the trick of, you know, let me drop the lower half of the terms. They're not helping me much. And for the larger half of the terms, I'll use that they're all at least N over 2. Actually, I'm going to cheat very mildly here because this lower bound kind of assumes that n is even, but I'm too lazy to do it uh, when n is odd. So anyway, we're going to see better bounds. Uh, okay, so this is n over 2 to the n over 2. Actually, I checked. This is correct even when n is odd, but I mean, the little proof does not show it. But if you're worried, it's true. Um, okay, so actually that's pretty good. And we have here already two kind of matching bounds. They're both sort of of the n to the n form. Um, so let's say we just wanted to under, you know, take these two bounds and kind of compare them. Uh, here's another like sort of uh, life tip that we'll encounter again and again. If you have like some kind of asymptotic expression and you don't exactly know what's going on with it, or you want to compare it to another asymptotic expression, and like both of them are really big quantities, then just keep taking the logs of the expressions on like both things you're trying to compare until it looks more understandable. Um, so we can do that. We can take the log of all three of the quantities we have here and deduce that, um, well, let's take the ln just to be, I don't know, mathematical about it for some reason. Uh, ln of n factorial is at most, ln of n to the n is n ln n. And it's at least, okay, this one was n over 2, ln n over 2. Okay, and now these are looking a little bit more easy to understand. In fact, I suppose, oh, had I taken the base 2 log, it would have been even easier to deal with this. But in particular, this is half n ln n uh, plus a half, n over 2 ln of a half. But anyway, that's a minus order n. Let's leave it at that. Let's say minus theta of n even. OK, and so this is easy to compare to this. I mean, OK, this theta of n is asymptotically smaller than n ln n. So just kind of ignore it. And now we have n ln n versus a half n ln n. OK, so our two bounds for the logarithm of what we are going for are the same up to a factor of half. So that's pretty good. It's only pretty good, though, because we really cared about the exponential of this, which means that our two bounds are off by like a quadratic power, actually, which is still not terrible, but we're going to try to do somewhat better. But anyway, I mean, at this level, what we can conclude is not even too bad. We can exponentiate this and conclude that n factorial is exponential in, or I'll write it with 2, 
2 to the theta and ln n. Log n. Uh, which is pretty good, but it's not super great because you know the theta is in the exponent, which is like making it off by a power rather than off by a constant factor. But anyway, it's really quick and easy, so that's a good start. Okay, so now we would like to do better than this, and uh, shortly we will take the principled approach to that, which is to take the log of this big product to convert it to a big sum. And then we know some tricks for handling big sums. In particular, we're going to use this integral trick again that we saw last time, which on one hand I insisted didn't come up very much, and then on the other hand it's come up for us like twice now. But I think that'll be it. Um, but before we get to that, I'm going to show you one more uh, ad hoc bound, which is still really simple and gives like a very good bound. So uh, this ad hoc bound will be based on our favorite Taylor series. I know it's your favorite Taylor series, namely the one for e to the x. So this is a fact. e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial, if you wish, plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus etc. And this holds for all real x. And depending on your math textbook, it may even be the definition of what is e, or what is e to the x. OK, now actually, of course, if you like, you can even put to the 1 over 1 factorial here, and this is x to the 0 over 0 factorial. Uh, OK, so I said this is like an ad hoc approach, so I'll just show you this trick. One thing that you can say is that, well, um, this is also true if we just stick with positive x's. And in that case, all the terms here are positive, so it would only become smaller if we dropped some of the terms. So in fact, uh, let's just drop all of the terms, except for one. We'll keep the nth term. Okay, so on one hand, we just dropped a ton of stuff, but on the other hand, it's going to be pretty good. And what is the nth term? It's x to the n over n factorial. And therefore, if we rearrange that, we get uh, n factorial is at least uh, x to the n over e to the x for all, for any, if you will, uh, non-negative x. Um, great. So it's only a lower bound, but uh, we're only going to get a lower bound out of this trick. And now it's actually great. You can choose any x you want. Uh, depending on n, you could choose 2 or 3 or 4 or 6 and a half. Um, and there's a trade-off because the numerator gets bigger, the bigger x is, and the denominator also gets bigger. So there's some kind of trade-off. And you can use calculus to determine the best x, which is the back x that maximizes this expression when you treat n as a constant. I will not do the calculus exercise, but amusingly, when you do it, it turns out the best x is n. So we can now take x to be n which happens to be the best choice, funnily enough. And we conclude that n factorial is at least n to the n over e to the n. And this actually turns out to be a pretty great lower bound. In fact, it's a lot closer to our upper bound than our previous lower bound was. Uh, one way you can see that is to take the logs of both sides. Again, let me just, I can also write this as n to the e, n over e to the n, same difference. And uh, so if we take logs, we get that ln of n factorial is at least n ln n over e. Okay, ln of n over e is ln n minus ln e also known as ln n minus 1. So this equals uh, n ln n minus n. OK, you should compare that to before, where our lower bound for the log was like a half times n ln n, you know, minus something order n. OK, so it's much better. It's quite close to the upper bound we have. And so, in fact, this actually determines the logarithm of n factorial asymptotically. So putting this lower bound together with that upper bound, we get that ln 
of n factorial is asymptotically equivalent to n ln n. Um, or if you uh, want to exponentiate this, you get that n factorial is approximately n to the n, but approximately means up to a lower order term, which could be something like constant to the n. So that's still pretty good. And so if we, in fact, we do exponentiate, we have an upper bound for n factorial of n to the n and a lower bound of n to the n over e to the n. OK, so we're off by some factor that's between 1 and e to the n. But we don't know. Is it more like n to the n? Is it more like n to the n over e to the n? Is it in between? Is it like n to the n over 2 to the n? We don't know. We'll find out, though. It's more like n to the n over e to the n, as it turns out. OK. And uh, I'm going to continue to you know, stall before getting into Sterling's formula, which kind of reveals everything. But um, sticking a little uh, elementary, let's see if we can figure out what uh, n to the factorial is it more like? Is it more like n to the n? Is it more like n to the n over e to the n? n to the n over 2 to the n? What? So let's define uh, f of n by uh, saying that, well, n factorial equals n to the n over f of n. So like f of n is kind of like this mystery that we're trying to figure out. Or let's define it implicitly, but I mean it's saying f of n is n to the n over n factorial. So our, it's like our upper bound has f of n equals 1. Our lower bound has f of n equals e to the n. And we're kind of concerned, like, what is the real f of n? Um, and we can kind of uh, heuristically figure it out. So the calculation I'm about to do will heuristically tell us the answer. And if we speculate that f of n is of the form constant to the n, and we can figure out that constant by looking at the ratio of f of n plus 1 to f of n. Let me just write that. So I want to look at f of n plus 1 over f of n. Because this would be like c if f of n were n to the c. Sorry, c to the n. Uh, but we don't have to speculate. We can just write down what it is because we have the definition of f of n right here. So that's in the numerator n plus 1 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. That's f of n plus 1. f of n is n to the n over n factorial. And now let's see, some glorious calculation, the cancellation happens. This n factorial is really in the numerator. This one's really in the denominator. So we cancel them, and we get like an n plus 1 in the denominator. And actually, then we can cancel that with this thing. Uh, and now it's great because we have a, to the power of n. So this thing is actually n plus 1 over n to the n, also known as 1 plus 1 over n to the n. And hey presto, that it tends to e as n goes to infinity, as I hope you know. Sometimes that's the definition of e. Or if you like, if you pretend that 1 plus 1 over n by our most favorite approximation is e to the 1 over n, then this is like e to the 1 over n to the n, which is like e to the 1, which is e. So these calculations are all correct. Uh, the heuristic aspect is it doesn't exactly maybe uh, prove things, because this just says that in the limit it goes to e. But this tells us that basically the true answer is that this f of n is like something like e to the n. OK, so we kind of heuristically deduce that n factorial should be like something like n to the n over e to the n, which is like close to our lower bound. Well, this is exactly a lower bound. And uh, so now like our next step is to go even further into this and get it even uh, more tightly. Any questions right now? OK. So we have to do this because, I mean, boy, 
Um, binomial fill coefficients come up all the time in probability, and probability comes up all the time in TCS. And like binomial coefficients have like factorials built right into them. So got to do it. Got to know everything there is to know about them. So now it's time to really uh, do it. Uh, let's take the definition and log both sides. OK, well, I'm really saving. I'm not going to cram the word log in here everywhere. So I guess I'll just rewrite it. This is uh, ln 1 plus ln 2 plus ln 3 plus dot 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 plus ln n. OK, I guess this one's 0. So we don't have to worry about that. And now it's time for the integral trick to try to understand what this is. OK, so the trick there, as you may remember, is to plot the function ln and try to compare this sum with the integral, which we can figure out using calculus. So let's draw a picture. OK, so here's my t-axis. And here's 1. I'll try to draw ln. Something like that. That's ln t. And let's see. Let's make this n. OK, and so we're going to start making rectangles here. So this is 2, 3, 4. We have a rectangle that goes up like this, a rectangle that goes up like this, a rectangle that goes up like this. OK, and our last rectangle looks like this. OK, and this height is ln 2. This height is ln 3. This top thing is ln n. OK, and the point is that this uh, ln of n factorial is equal to the area of the rectangles. Okay, so we dropped that ln 1, which is 0. So the first rectangle should have area ln 2. And you know, has width 1 and height ln 2. Yeah, this one has width 1 and height ln 3, and width 1 and height ln 4, etc. OK, so uh, the area of the rectangles is more than the area under the curve. So the naive thing will give us a uh, lower bound for ln n factorial. So well, let me write like this, less than or equal to area under the curve. And we can get this with calculus. It's the integral from 1 to n of ln t dt. And I know you all remember this one from calculus. It's the antiderivative of ln t is t ln t minus, wait, what is it? Minus t. Thank you, yeah. If you don't believe me, you can differentiate this, and hopefully you'll get ln t. OK, and we need to evaluate this from t goes from like 1 up to n. OK, so I plug n into this, and I get n ln n minus n. And then I subtract from that what I get if I plug 1 in. So if I plug 1 in here, ln 1 is 0. And this is minus 1, so I subtract that, and I get plus 1. So that's it. That's my lower bound. So you can see it very barely exceeds this lower bound that we got by this other method. Our old lower bound was n ln n minus n. Now we got n ln n minus n plus 1. Um, but actually, that's going to be pretty, pretty good. It's actually consistent with our idea that this lower bound was like the tight one. This was the lower bound that was giving us approximately this e to the n of the denominator, which is going to be accurate. Uh, so let's save this as our lower bound. I'll just, I guess it's still true that this is greater than or equal to, even though it's actually equal, but I'll save it. To remember that it's a lower bound. Uh, good. Now, what about the upper bound? So, uh, for the upper bound, what I want to say is this is like at most the same integral, which gave us the lower bound, plus the area of the curvy triangles. OK, 
Okay, so plus this area. Actually, this is equal. I mean, it's equal. So now I would like to evaluate the area of these curvy triangles. And how am I going to do that? I'm going to do that by putting a wall here and like lining them all up against the wall. So I'm going to push all these curvy triangles over. So this one pushes over to here. I mean, the point is this does not change the area. It just moves it around. Okay, and then all the curvy triangles, I don't know if you can see it so well. Try to highlight. That is this excess are hanging out inside this rectangle. Good. Now, let's pretend they were actually triangles. They're actually, they actually curve in a little bit, but let's pretend that they're actually triangles. Uh, if they're actually triangles, then, you know, by picture, they would be taking up exactly half the area of this tall rectangle against the wall. They're actually taking up very slightly less than that because the curve is going, you know, this way, which is good because we want an upper bound. So, I mean, if I put less than or equal to here, I could put like straightened triangles here. And then we know exactly the area of the straightened triangles. It's half the area of the rectangle. Okay, so this, this is therefore half. Okay, the rectangle has width one and height ln n, so it's half ln n. Did I do it all right? I think so. Good, so let me clear this up. Uh, we have uh, now an upper and lower bound for log n factorial, which are very close. They differ only by this straightened triangle thing, which is a half long n, which is really great because that's like the third order term here. It's not the main term, it's not even the error term, it's like the third order term. So it's a real great bound. So in fact, let me just uh, exponentiate everything so we get a bound on n factorial. And we'll therefore deduce that n factorial uh, is at least, so the exponential of the lower bound is, uh, well, I got n to the n over e to the n times e. n to the n over e to the n times e. And upper bound is the exact same thing as that n to the n over e to the n times e, uh, but plus the exponential of the straightened thing, the straightened triangles, which is e to the half ln n is root n. So great. So this is, this is a really sharp bound. Okay, now we have n factorial pinned down extremely well. Like n to the n is the main term, e to the n is the next term, and then now we're just off by a factor of root n. It's quite small. Um, that's great. So in particular, we've shown that n factorial is, now we move the theta down, we have to put a little tilde in because of the root n, but it's theta tilde of n to the n over e to the n. Right, this hides a factor which is logarithmic in this, logarithmic polylog in this, log of this is like n log n, and root n is indeed like a constant power of n log n. Uh, so that's great, and you know, if you weren't tough, you would just stop there, that's pretty good. But, uh, well, we'll basically keep going a little bit, and now ask ourselves, any, any questions about that, by the way? Well, we'll be like, what about the next? I mean, what is it exactly? Is it like root n? Is that correct? factor correct? Is this factor correct? If you think about it, probably this one should be more correct, right? Because like for our lower bound, we just said like, oh, the original rectangles are bigger than the area into the curve. For the other bound, we like almost got it right, except for the difference between straight and curvy triangles, right? That was the one that led to this one. So this one's probably more right, and indeed that is true. And uh, see the 
the gap of the upper bound from uh, the truth long and factorial is like the area of these slivers, which are just the differences between the curvy triangles and the straight triangles. So it's like the area of these pieces that look like this, plus this, plus this, plus this. OK, so if we could pin down the area of that difference exactly, we'd have it exactly. This is where I'm going to kind of stop and not do that. But I leave it as an exercise for you. Not a joke, it's not that hard. Uh, to show that the area, the total area of the slivers is at most order one. And this is with respect to n going to infinity. What I mean by that is actually, even if you take n out to infinity, these slivers are so small, you add them up, the total area is at most a constant. In fact, you know, if you just mess around, you should be able to get like at most, I don't know, one eighth or something. It's really quite small. Which means that the lower bound, in truth, is equal to our upper bound minus big O of 1. And when you exponentiate that, it means that you know, the thing you actually get is this right-hand side times exponential in a constant, which is just some other constant. So once you do this exercise, you can conclude that uh, n factorial, uh, that this one is correct, is up to a constant uh, n to the n over e to the n times square root n. And you very rarely need more than this. So you can mentally stop here. Well, actually, sometimes you need more than this. So again, if you're really, really, really tough, you're like, please tell me what the constant is. And the constant is square root of 2 pi. But to prove that, you need to start thinking about Gaussian random variables, which we will not do until next time. So let me just leave it uh, by telling you that answer. And with the constant, you get something called Stirling's formula. And Stirling's formula is like the asymptotic form of n factorial. It says that n factorial is asymptotic to square root 2 pi, square root n, n to the n over e to the n. So it's great, right? Pi and e together in one formula. And what if you want more than that? Then you're really sick, but sometimes you, you want it. Uh, I'll tell you. It's this times 1 plus or minus order 1 over n. So that's how close this is to the answer. And like this constant, oh, is like even 1 12th. And you can figure out everything. But this was really genuinely enough. <laughs>